Kurt, you got a hold of us uh, and wanted to talk about some of your your new initiatives at uh, Transform Finance. And um, none of us were really familiar with uh, with your work, um, so we've kind of been perusing the website. But uh, why don't you tell us about tell us about your group and uh, and and what you guys are what you what you work on. Yeah, sure. Um, so Transform Finance is a nonprofit organization that was founded 10 years ago, uh, broadly to do research, do education, and to advise impact investors on aligning their capital with social justice. So a very broad mission, uh, but we've covered a lot of ground over the past 10 years working on uh, issues from racial justice to quality jobs to worker ownership to uh, participatory investment in the place-based investment context. Uh, and a lot of our work has been uh, basically building a bridge between communities who are uh, achieving change through other means like policy, advocacy, community organizing work, uh, bridging those folks with impact investors saying, okay, how can we develop frameworks that actually take these um, community priorities into account? And at our founding, we ended up uh, developing these three transformative finance principles, which really guides all of our work um, and the work that I'm talking about with you all today, um, which is one, uh, investments should be community owned and governed whenever possible. Two, investment should be non-extractive, so leaving the investee better off than it was before the investment. And the third is uh, achieving a fair balance of risk and return across all stakeholders. And so these are really kind of North Star principles uh, for all of our work, uh, no matter what the topic area is, that we really uh, try to push investors towards and advocate for strategies that are uh, really demonstrating what, what it looks like to be close to that North star. And so recently, uh, we've really started digging into ownership as an area that is super important in a lot of different ways, but that really encapsulates those three principles. Um, especially when considering the context we're in where shareholders and investors essentially own everything. And with that ownership comes the right to economic profit, uh, the right to sell uh, the asset, whether it's a company, real estate, land, whatever it is. Um, and then also the, the control over it. So making decisions, hiring managers and, and all that. So thinking about, okay, this is a really important piece is kind of, who controls and who benefits from the basic building blocks of the economy, we've really started to look at financing strategies that are shifting ownership from investors to other stakeholders, um, like workers, like communities, um, like nonprofit organizations in a place-based context that can make decisions around capital flows. Um, so that's really uh, the, the general area of interest for Transform Finance these days is looking at how to mobilize impact capital for shared ownership projects. After you, Matt. No? Well, uh, well, actually, I do have one question, simple question, which is how did you get started with this? Like, which yeah, is personal? So, yeah, I came to Transform Finance uh, about six years ago, um, and I was kind of politicized in college by solidarity economy movements. I was very much like a climate uh, activist and really cared about the environment, but then kind of looking under the, under the hood of the economy as I was looking at, okay, well, who is responsible for climate change and where is the power really being held? I started to really think about, okay, how how is the economy structured? Why is capitalism leading to all these issues? Um, and that kind of broadened my scope to look at, okay, what are what are models that are proving different ways that are maybe more in line with the earth, more in line with people, avoiding the extraction of the mainstream economy? And that brought me to co-ops as a really powerful alternative. Uh, and this is really just something I was kind of studying on my own um, and, and reaching out to folks informally to try to learn more about 
about this space. Um, and I'm from the Boston area. Originally, I'm from Newton, Massachusetts. Um, so I got connected to some folks doing solidarity economy work in Boston, um, uh, specifically the New Economy Coalition, the Boston Eugene Project, which was really a formative experience, um, just doing some kind of like volunteer and intern work with, with those groups back in like 2016 or so. Um, and through that, I really got interested in the finance piece because I was seeing this really powerful examples of solidarity economies being created on the ground. Um, but I had this lingering question of like, okay, how do we build this within the system that we have? You know, a lot of it's grant funded or there's, you know, angel investors, some in, you know, impact investors are interested in this stuff. But uh, if we're really to build these out, we need to figure out new ways to get capital uh, into the space. So that led me to transform finance uh, and I got connected to Andrea Armeni, our co-founder um, and former ED, uh, who's now um, a senior advisor uh, with the organization and uh, got looped into transfer finances work. And I've been here since 2017. That's very helpful background. Thanks. Um, if, if you're familiar with GEO, then you know that economic, the grassroots economics, which is our name, but economics, economic democracy in general and co-ops in particular are a lot of our focus. And, mm -hmm. you know, the co-op movement has been around for a long time. Some folks would actually say it's ancient. And, um, and you probably have noticed that we have a significant focus on worker cooperatives and workplace democracy. We'd love to just have your perspectives in general, particularly where you're coming from and sort of the impact investor focus that your organization has. I'd love to get your perspectives, frankly, candidly, on the co-op movement, its its progress, its challenges, uh, the co about the co-op movement in general, and maybe the worker co-op movement in particular. If you have a sense of that, yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, like I said, I came to this work through cooperatives as kind of my uh, like gateway to alternative economic organizing, a grassroots economic organizing. Uh, to use y'all's term. Uh, so, you know, and, and we still have lots of overlaps with, with the COP movement. Um, so, you know, I have, have some finger on the pulse. Um, but, you know, I think it's, I think what's really powerful about co-ops is it's international, you know, cooperatives are recognized all around the world. Uh, and I think that's really important. And a lot of folks in the U.S. here don't even necessarily have that lens when thinking about, okay, you know, systemic change to the economy. I think you can only go so far if you're only thinking about uh, one country. Um, of course, there's plenty of legislation at the federal level that we need to have happen in lots of different ways to, you know, build other sorts of models uh, besides co-ops, uh, maybe, uh, you know, one at a time here in the U.S., but thinking broadly, and um, there's real power in having like a global solidarity economy and cooperative movement. Um, from my perspective, working with investors or being at an investor-focused organization, I think there's a slow but growing awareness of cooperatives as an alternative form, um, as well as other forms of employee ownership and kind of alternative enterprise ownership, um, which is the big area of interest for us right now is looking at kind of the broad menu of options. And I can get into that um, in a bit. But there's a growing awareness that cooperatives are are a real alternative. Um, and I think that's also mirroring the kind of public image. Like I, I was talking to someone recently about REI, which, you know, is a consumer cooperative, not a worker cooperative. And for a while, they were not really publicizing the fact that they were a cooperative, wasn't like on the storefront. But now, you know, in New York, when I go uh, to Soho, where there's the REI, it's like giant, uh, you know, on, on the window, join our co-op. And, you know, they have like some graphics of people like holding hands or something like that. So I think there's kind of more cachet in, in cooperativism. And I think it probably goes along with like the growth of uh, B corporations, benef public benefit corporations, and just like corporate social responsibility. So I think they're kind of latching onto that. But I think 
to the extent that co-ops are being, uh, you know, seen as this beneficial alternative, even for people who don't understand what it is, that's a win. But now we have to kind of do that education and be like, okay, well, what actually are co-ops? So we do some of that work with investors um, for all different versions of these, you know, alternative business forms um, to try to break down what it is because investors are pretty sticky in terms of uh, taking on new things. They need a lot of information uh, in a few different ways to to jump into a new a new trend. Um, but I'm hopeful that 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 there is actual positive momentum here. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, a lot of our work I should mention too is looking at, okay, what are the barriers to capital flow to these alternative business forms? Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm happy to talk about some of that too. I, I, I would I definitely hope we have a chance to explore that. Um, and maybe my next point, I want to go a little deeper with what you just said. It's a very helpful answer. Thank you. Um, and very uh, that's a very encouraging answer, too. Um, I've been in the cooperative movement for the most part since I was a teenager in the late 70s and really practically full time since the mid 90s. And, you know, the co-op movement is pretty bad at telling its own story, you know, and uh, it's sort of one of the best kept secrets, really. Um, in in terms of justice and sustainability, and it's far from perfect. But um, so your, your your response there is very encouraging. Um, if I can go a little bit deeper, you know, because especially you can see the focus of geo is very much about economic democracy, workplace democracy, and in particular, you know, the National Cooperative Business Association has or used to have a motto where it say co-ops make better citizens. And Mm -hmm. the idea being that when people truly participate as co-owners of an enterprise through some sort of, some sort of co-op economic democracy or workplace democracy, it requires them to think bigger, right? It requires them to think um, in more strategic terms about the economy overall. And it tends to make people more engaged in the economy overall and that quite naturally since these are rank and file people usually they tend to think more through a justice and sustainability lens what does fair economics look like what does fair commerce look like right and so so a lot of us are from from the geo side of things are looking at you know the the beneficial cultural developments that happen when people are engaged with economic democracies and especially workplace democracies. But I'm wondering, you know, how much skepticism do you get or have you had in-depth conversations? Your, you or your organization had in-depth conversations with impact investors about actual economic democracy and workplace mm-hmm. democracy, because those are things that still a lot of highly placed people are skeptical about those things. And so I'm just curious as to any, you know, how those conversations might have gone for you if you've had them. Yeah. Um, so it's interesting because when we're talking about economic democracy and workplace democracy, I think sometimes the elephant in the room is we're also like that power doesn't just come from nowhere that's given to workers. That's power that's typically in the hands of external investor shareholders, right? So this is part of the the tricky nature of trying to get more capital actors to finance this this movement is, at least for some kinds of investors, it's saying, hey, instead of investing in businesses that you could have, you know, ownership over, think of the traditional venture capital model where, uh, you know, you put equity into a company, you have voting, uh, you know, voting percentage, you own a piece of the company, and then years down the line, you sell that piece, hoping to, that the company grows in the meantime and you make a profit off of that share. When we're thinking about uh, businesses that do economic democracy in a deep way, that's off the table. So on many levels, we're saying to investors, hey, let's we're, we're gonna take away some of your power because it's more fair and more equitable to workers. Um, that's not to say there aren't investors who are interested in doing that. And I think it's important to 
acknowledge that there are some really, really amazing partners um, in the finance world who are down to figure out, okay, how do we make these models work? Um, so in the cooperative space, we have a lot of uh, loan funds and CDFIs, uh, community development financial institutions that are specifically designed to lend to co-ops to help businesses convert from traditional uh, enterprise forms to co-ops um, and other forms of employee ownership like ESOPs. Um, and I think it's really important to, to acknowledge uh, those, those types of investors. Um, where we have really been looking uh, more so these days uh, is at that fund and intermediary level. Um, because a lot of the work that's happening in the field, not just co-ops, but other alternative business forms. Um, so uh, just to name a few like ESOPs, employee stock ownership plans, um, employee ownership trusts are a new emerging form of employee ownership that use a perpetual purpose trust, uh, which is uh, a legal tool to seal the purpose of a company uh, within this external body that makes governance decisions over the company. And there's lots of different ways to use those perpetual purpose trusts. Um, and then there's also lots of new, exciting and interesting and untested forms of employee ownership and other stakeholder ownership being created, like holding companies of cooperatives. There's a few, uh, there's a few of those out there. Um, there's partial models that are granting some shares, some shares over time, um, that are doing doing old old things in new ways um, in order to, to get around some of the barriers to capital. Um, but within, within all these uh, models, there's intermediaries and funds that are collecting money from asset owners like foundations, uh, high net worth individuals, um, family offices, and then, and then doing the investments into businesses themselves. When we look at that fund level, that's where I think, we get some of the interesting questions around, okay, who's investing and who's not. Uh, you get a lot of the very progressive uh, young people who have access to family wealth now. Um, some of the progressive foundations and family offices have new leadership uh, that are interested in economic democracy and uh, deep racial and economic justice and seeing economic democracy as a tool for that. Um, but a lot of the money that's coming in is because of individuals' journeys, own personal journeys within those institutions or with their own money and convincing the trustees or whomever is uh, in decision-making roles at those financial institutions to invest in these funds that are in turn investing in the, um, the alternative uh, ownership model. Um, so I, I think, this is a very long-winded, perhaps, uh, answer to your question, but um, I think we ha currently have uh, a, a slice of investors who are really interested in economic democracy and see the transformative potential of these models. And I think there's an even bigger slice of investors who could be in that group, but have not been exposed to it. Uh, or are maybe risk risk averse and are not uh, comfortable learning about these new models and the funds that are investing them uh, and just need a little bit of support, education, awareness building to, to actually get there. So that's one of the roles that Transform Finance is trying to take in the field is to try to add to the investors that are doing that. Um, but then I think there's this whole exciting new uh, area of innovation around developing financial products and new vehicles to get new sources of capital altogether uh, into this space. Um, and a lot of the conversations I'm having are uh, sounding like, how do we get CDFIs, community development, financial institution capital into this space? Because there's a lot of debt capital that they could provide um, to go alongside the fund investments to do conversions. Um, how do we get government money? You know, there's new uh, federal dollars coming down the pipeline with um, the uh, IRA. Um, the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund is a part of that too. To have a, a there's a climate element to some of this. The um, SSBCI, which is an acronym I always forget 
the name of, sorry. <laughs> uh, so there's all these tools and, and I think we're at this moment of, of the field of folks who are, you know, building co-ops and other uh, alternative business forms of saying, okay, we've learned a lot. Uh, we have good infrastructure for some kinds of business creation, but, you know, it's clearly not enough if we're going to transform the economy. How do we really unlock even more capital to this space. Um, and there's a lot of really exciting conversations happening. This is great. I totally have a question about this. I, um, I'm a member of the Colorado Solidarity Fund, which, and I think you know Nathan Schneider and Jason Weiner and other folks, they have a video on the, on the website. Um, so they're also members of that fund. It's just an investment club. It's small. We're talking tiny amounts of money and not a ton of people. Um, but I was just thinking to myself, like, huh, why am I, why do I do that, right? And I think the explanation on my side is um, I can't afford to just give grants. I don't have enough money to be giving people grants. On the other hand, I do want to support people's work. So these investments are at such a low rate of return and on such, you know, generous terms that uh, it's a way, it's like the next best thing to giving a grant. For somebody who can't afford to give a grant so that's kind of that would that'd be that would be sort of my motivation as an investor in that scenario um but i think when it comes to the question of larger investors i guess my question is sort of why why are these folks not just making grants if they've got big money and if they don't so yeah that would be one question like why not just make why not use grant funding and then the second thing, because I, so I guess my question would be, well, if you're not, it's not for the returns because it's not going to be big returns. So what's the control, like control would only, the only thing I could conceive of would be to be some control element or some, you know, like with a grant, I have a friend who inherited some money. He set up a foundation and his print concept was in 10 years, all the money needs to be gone. Mm -hmm. So he kind of, did it so that he organized himself out of that wealth. But it's, so I'm wondering kind of like, this doesn't seem like people are intending to disappear as investors, right? They're not intending to give away all their money. So what's the, I'm a little bit kind of curious, what's in it for them? <laughs> That's what I would say. Other than good, you know, good things and nice things that we'd like to see happen in the world, which of course, that's all, that's all good. But I'm curious about the economic concept. Yeah, I mean, for the investors who are currently putting their money into uh, the alternative ownership space, whether that's through a fund um, like Seed Commons is uh, a fund that invests in co-ops, uh, those place-based uh, CDFI lenders that I mentioned, um, I think I think that last point you made is is probably the main reason they want to do good in the world and they actually see co-ops and economic democracy as a as a good way to do that. Um, but I think your first question is actually interrelated here. I think why they make an investment over a grant is the same as, as you, they want to continue to, you know, be able to deploy capital going forward. Um, you know, there's, there's only so, so many grants that, uh, someone can give before they're out of money. Right. Um, and this is kind of the idea behind, the way foundations are structured. Um, if you're familiar, they only give 5% of their money away uh, annually as grants. The other 95 is invested to grow their endowment. This is the typical foundation structure to grow their endowment so they can you know, theoretically make more grants in the future. Now, I think the interesting you know, theoretical ethical questions come in there where it's like, you know, well, 5% is a, is a law. They have to do that but they could do more um, or they could do different kinds of investments, right? Like um, you know, if you, you say a market rate and I use quotes because there is really no market rate, but if a market rate investment is say like seven, 8% return uh, and a grant is a negative 100% return, uh, there's a big range in between there. Uh, and there's a lot of, capital products and tools that will get you somewhere in there. Um, 
you know, when we we're talking about investors who are really thinking um, concessionary and really, you know, putting the impact first that are getting returned, like these are not grant makers, we're still talking like, you know, zero to 3% uh, as kind of like the, the baseline. Like if an investor is making that, you're like, we're not even beating inflation in these days. Uh, but that money is still cycled back and you can still uh, redeploy that in the future. And that concessionary capital is very important to all of all of the uh, businesses and funds that we're talking about here, uh, especially because it allows more market rate investors to come in and say, okay, there's a chunk that's you know at this cheaper end, zero to three, I can come in at five to seven and say, um, this is very loose math, but that that concept does happen a lot. Uh, but what's what's interesting in in this is I think to really like reconsider you know what even a loss looks like, um, especially if you're say someone like your friend who sets up a foundation and uh, you know is saying I want this money eventually to go deploy. I'm not trying to grow in perpetuity. You know you could sit, consider um, things like recoverable grants, which uh, are kind of structured like like a loan, but if um, the loan but the loan could be forgiven and it's considered a grant, um, you know, and that kind of places your expected return somewhere between negative 100 and zero. Right. Um, and, you know, I think there's interesting ways to think about it. Um, that's not so binary. Uh, and this is also simultaneously a call for foundations as, you know, some of the financial actors that are, best position to support economic democracy and alternative ownership enterprises. Um, they, I think, can and should be more creative in the kinds of financing they're willing to, to give out. Um, and that's really because there's just this mentality and philanthropy to grow the endowment in perpetuity. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's really surprising sometimes even, um, you know, the folks who work at an endowment on the mission investment sides, you know, they're looking for impactful deals. Some of the funds that we are talking about here, the Seed Commons, uh, Apis and Heritage, which is a, a ESOP conversion fund focused on racial equity, you know, even some of these really impactful uh, funds are not fitting the criteria of the mission investors because it's either not enough or, you know, there's, a, I think, a mismatch uh, on the risk return profile that they're looking for. Um, and one addendum on that is, which I think is really important, is a lot of the risks that investors perceive in this space are not actually there. Like, you're not all the time just giving your money to, you know, a bunch of anarchists or whatever. <laughs> like a lot of these are very financially sound. And there's tons of evidence that uh, that shared ownership, co-ops, ESOPs, other forms of worker ownership are actually very sound investments. They're more resilient in the face of economic crises. There's productivity gains uh, that companies have when they convert to worker ownership. And that's not the first argument that I like to make personally when I'm advocating for these models, but there's evidence there that shows that these are actually, uh, can, they can be sound. Um, and that's not to uh, uh, underestimate the costs that come with converting businesses, which is usually how finance gets involved. Um, you know, you're probably not gonna make as much as if you were to invest in say like private equity. Um, but if you're doing that kind of investment, you're not, you're not, you're not equating that in the same, in the same bucket. If I can jump on that risk question for a second, not so much about return on investment or how much, but, um, if I want to drill down on that for just a second, um, that's something I'm very curious about. I, I work closely with one of the founding funds of the seed commons and, been watching it evolve over about eight, nine years now, watching that whole model develop. And I've been sort of wondering, are we now or will we soon be at the point where we have a strong enough case, where, where, we, where, where there's enough history, there's enough evidence, there's enough statistical analysis, we can look at it and we can actually say, here is the actual risk of, for example, investing in worker co-ops you know, investing in these funds that invest in worker co-ops, that loan to worker co-ops. Um, are we in a position to see what the, you know, what the loss rate is, you know, what the default rate is, uh, 
what the, you know, not just the amount of return on investment, but, you know, what the real risk is. Do we have, you know, are we there yet in terms of the documentation or do we still have a ways to go before we have, uh, you know, sort of irrefutable evidence of what the risk actually is? Mm. Yeah, that's a really good question. And I'd be curious how fund managers themselves, you know, like Seed Commons would, would answer the question. My sense is that in certain areas or in certain types of investments, we do have a track record. Um, say, you know, startup co-ops that need, you know, loans of, you know, one hundred to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to get started. We've we've collectively as a co-op financing movement, we do have enough deals that we could look at uh, and and say, okay, here's how many loans defaulted. Here's how these businesses grew. Here's how many shut down after five years. You know, we, we, we should have that data. I think there's a couple constraints um, that, you know, I would really love to see fix, which, um, you know, some folks like the worker to owners, initiative, folks like DAWI and Democracy Work Institute are doing really good work on, but I think more needs to be done to collect that data um, and, and synthesize it to tell that story. But yeah, I think there's reasons that some funds don't want to share it, right? You know, they have, you know, some of that proprietary information and some, you know, term sheets and legal documents that they might ne not necessarily want to share. Uh, but there's, there's definitely a need to collect that data. But when when we zoom out from from just that kind of like startup co-op uh, investment, um, I think there's a couple other contexts that also have a lot of track record. ESOP financing, there's been a lot of, um, and there is actually uh, plenty of data on risk and firm success and productivity and all that there that I've seen. Um, the National Center for Employee Ownership um, and Rutgers University does a lot of um, data collection on that. So I would say in certain areas, there is a very clear case. It's there. We might need to collect, you know, synthesize more of the data, but, you know, it's out there. But there's really a lot of new and emerging models um, and financing models that are still untested. And I think it's really important to uh, continue to test those. Um, a very important factor in all this is that, you know, as these new funds that are mission focused uh, are emerging and new strategies and, and old strategies, you know, even this is the case for co-op lenders too, is they need philanthropic dollars um, to help, you know, pay for staff, um, to go into businesses for TA providers um, to provide support. You know, there's a whole network of uh, organizations that help build ownership culture and help get access to legal services uh, and government services and all that. Um, you know, there's a lot of philanthropic grant dollars that need to go into this because it is mission oriented. Um, and I think a lot of people use that as a knock against the movement to say, oh, this actually, you know, it can only be philanthropically supported. It's that makes it risky. Uh, it's not competing fairly, quote unquote, with the traditional business space. But I actually think that is totally not true. If you look at uh, the way that our you know policies are set up and the way that our you know financial system operates, there's so many loopholes and uh, you know benefits and uh, dollars that are available for traditional enterprises, especially the most extractive kinds like like private equity, you know, they they have tons of incentives and and uh, tax breaks from the government to do the kind of financing they do. Um, I think in my you know, vision of how cooperatives and other alternative ownership enterprises scale is, yes, we need to have funding from philanthropy to do the research to support the early movers and build that base so we can show that it's not risky. But over time, I think the policy becomes more and more important um, as we you know, try to scale, because otherwise we're not going to be able to compete in the market with with traditional finance. That's very encouraging. Thank you. I look forward to, you know, getting stronger data, particularly in the co-op side and particularly in the worker co-op side. I look forward to us getting more and more ability to make the case 
you know, whatever the risk is, being able to firmly document that risk, I think, could unlock a lot. You know, people can sort of qualify and quantify the risk in a reliable way. Um, anyway, I don't want to dominate. Uh, that's I may have other follow up questions, but that's thank you for that. I have more questions, but Josh, you have a so far, to... Matt. Nope. You sure? Yeah. Um, so, Kurt, I think. I'm feeling like, oh, okay, maybe tell me if this is a correct understanding of, of a very simple, simple expression of kind of what the strategy is. Um, so I've been translating this work by this guy, Luis Rossetto, who's like a Chilean writer on solidarity economy. And his, he emphasizes in talking about cooperative economics, the goal in a cooperative is for capital accumulation to be internal as much as possible and increasingly internal like you don't want external capital all the capital that's accumulated sh ideally should be generated internally and anything that's external you want to internalize you don't want to keep a presence of a lot of external capital in your business you want to kind of get rid of that so it seems like what you're describing for example in terms of conversions where there's a huge need for capital to pay off the previous owners that I could see sort of capital coming, a concept of capital coming in to facilitate this process of owners, of the workers getting ownership. And then ultimately the external capital should be reduced to zero. Mm -hmm. And ultimately meaning in shorter term than a thousand years, <laughs> like ultimately meaning relatively soon. Is that an accurate description of sort of the strategy of this is like is is it to have capital is capital on the idea that you're investing only to facilitate a process where you are going to have no role like you're, you're not going to be involved in that financially or in other forms yeah for the most part that's where most of the activity that we see in the field is is in that conversion process and you're right uh, the whole conversion process, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting because there's a lot of parallels with the leverage buyouts that private equity funds do where you uh, get a loan or you get debt capital from a variety of sources, could be a bank, uh, and you use that money to pay out the lender, the existing owner of the business. Uh, and then over time, the company pays back that loan through profits. You know, that's very simple. Mm -hmm. Form, but eventually you want to pay off that loan uh, as you know, so that you don't have that debt on your balance sheet. But there's a lot of different ways that we see this happening. Uh, and one really important factor to consider is the selling owner typically wants to get out as fast as possible, right? If you're retiring, you know, you've been in a business for you know many years. Uh, some are some are willing to remain involved in some way. You know, might take a board seat as their uh, essentially it was called seller financing. You know, as their uh, their loan is getting paid back. Um, but uh, it's much more attractive if you can go to an owner and say, "Hey, we'll buy you out day one, and then you know we'll manage the 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 balance sheet of, of the loan. So there are some new financing models uh, that are emerging to to figure that out in, in a way that uh, gives that owner that liquidity up front. So it's, that's super important. Can I ask, I'll ask another one related, which is a question that I know Josh is, we've talked about before, but the um, one thing that we've noticed, right? There's been this uh, more flexible cooperative laws have been passed in a number of states that allow for greater ownership and participation by outside investors, including voting rights, right? And I'm, some people are very enthusiastic about this as a way to uh, make it easier to get an outside investors involved and to get capital coming in. It also, of course, from the co-op side, seems like doing the opposite of what I just described, right? It's mm -hmm. it's actually giving external capital a bigger presence and actually starting to have more to stick around, to be there and have a permanent or, you know, longer term role. And I know that you're one of your principles is employee control and ownership, but how do you see those new looser 
I would think that those new legal scenarios would make it a lot more appealing to an easier sell to outside investors if they can feel like um, it's not, they're not just giving their money to a worker co-op and the workers are going to have all the control and all the say and they don't, you know, they got nothing. Yeah, I think it's an interesting question. Um, and I, I actually might be more, uh, more investor friendly than some, some folks in the cooperative movement where I think there are, there are situations where it could actually make sense for investors to maintain some voting, voting say in the company. Um, and essentially if you're talking about like investor membership, like say I, you know, a multi-stakeholder co-op where there's a worker class, worker share class and investor share class, um, you, know, you can structure those classes to have different kinds of rights. Like you, it doesn't have to be even where it's like, okay, 50% investors, 50% workers. You can make sure that the workers still have majority control over the company. Um, the investors might just have, you know, a say, you know, a, a seat at the board, um, but it allows them to do equity like investments into the the company where you buy you know or actually it's not even equity like i shouldn't say it's equity in the company you buy shares um, and own a piece of it like a traditional equity investment does of course there are ways to have that kind of financing um financing without doing that um, you know equal exchange is a, a co-op that pioneered uh, a preferred equity model where investors could buy a share that uh they can sell just like a regular equity product, but it doesn't come with voting rights. So you know you don't have to do you don't have to do it in that like actual membership way. Um, but if you think about it, like investors are actually partners uh, a lot of the time. Um, it, it calls to mind um, one uh, a lot of the co-op lenders that invest in you know early stage co-ops are already doing a lot of advice and might have a TA or technical assistance shop within them you know i'm thinking of folks like the working world uh, which is based here in new york city you know they work uh really closely with their uh with their businesses and say okay in order to get this loan because we want you to be in a you know a financial success we want you to be a sustainable business we're going to help you you know make certain decisions um which they'll you know, come is kind of tied with the capital. So they're not getting equity in the company, but they're already doing something similar to saying, hey, we're a partner, we're showing up, we're gonna help you. So I don't think it's always bad to have uh, investors have a say. But uh, another example that comes to mind, it's not a co-op, um, it's a company called Organically Grown Company, uh, which is structured as a perpetual purpose trust owned company. Uh, it's out in Oregon. It's an uh, organic um, food distribution company. Uh, and they have a really interesting governance model where they have I, it's either four or five stakeholder classes that all participate at a table uh, and make decisions around um, you know, the company and how it's stay, staying to its purpose, which is outlined in the, the purpose trust documents that govern it. Um, but one of those stakeholders is investors um, and the investors who are working on the deal were so integral to helping set up this structure in this real partnership um, that you know when it came to the end, where they're you know developing uh, you know the final governance table, they're saying, hey, we deserve a seat at the table. You know, we put our money into your company. Uh, we have a long-term interest in its success, and we're just one among, you know, these other several stakeholders, which include, uh, you know, workers at the company, suppliers, community members. So I think I think it kind of makes sense there. I, I'm willing to to give investors that seat. I don't think all investors are are bad. Have you, so um, you brought up equal exchange and their preferred share model. And that's one of the questions I've been sitting on is, you know, we do have this existing model in, in uh, you know, uh, the worker co-op world that is uh, well tested and understood. And, and it doesn't seem to have to get much play in conversations like this. Everybody's talking about new, new structures and new forms, um, when it seems to me anyway, like the preferred share model is really underexplored as a possible mechanism for getting more people in. Of course, the, the thing with preferred shares is they do not come with voting rights, but they are um, a, you know, a type of equity investment. 
Um, and I would, you know, I believe that it was its preferred shares that uh, they sell in uh, the direct public offerings that, uh, you know, like, um, what is it? Uh, impact, capital impact partners, I think, uh, uh, kind of came up with that uh, model or, or really uh, uh, promoted it a lot. So I'm just wondering if, if uh, any of the kind of alternatives uh, for getting uh, capital into the space that you've been looking at uh, are are using preferred shares, this kind of existing model that we have, or uh, yeah, yeah, or not. I feel, I also feel like it's underexplored, um, and I I should I should preface by saying um, yeah the the. Financial innovation, doing you know direct deals into co-ops is less my expertise. Um, there's a great report um, by I think Considered Capital that you know goes through all the different kind of funky instruments that have been used to uh, invest in in co-ops like like preferred equity. Um, but I think it probably comes down to okay, what kind of businesses are uh, you know, the best fit for these different products, like to go back to equal exchange, they're one of the biggest co-ops in the country and they're very successful. Um, so that product, which I think had a, like a fixed dividend per year, depending on, or maybe it wasn't fixed. It was tied to their profits. I, I can't remember right now. Um, but because it was, you know, big, successful, you knew it was cash positive. You, you could expect that return. So I think it made sense for them. Um, it might not make sense for a small startup co-op to have that, right? Um, you also have to consider when talking about equity versus debt investments, um, is the company growth oriented? Like, are they going to grow? Um, a big, you know, reason why investors like equity is because, you know, they buy a piece of the company when it's small and they have 20, 30%. And then when it grows that 20, 30%, you know, is a much bigger, uh, valuation, um, not all co-ops are seeking to grow. Um, so the whether or not you would want to do an equity investment, whether it's um, you know preferred or voting, I should say, or or not, um, is is a big factor um, when thinking about innovations uh, in in the space in terms of the financing co-ops and other other models. Um, I think there's increasing attention being paid to um, the growth stage co-ops. Um, and you have folks like start.coop, which is an incubator um, that are developing um, those co-ops. Um, there's an initiative run by Zebras Unite called P6 Capital, which is a kind of deal syndication platform for co-ops that are seeking growth capital. So I think in, in those contexts, you might see more ap applicability for uh, the preferred equity models. Um, but my guess is, as to why we're not seeing as much of it is that the co-ops that are seeking investment aren't necessarily the right fit for that product. But probably there there could be more, at least more awareness that this is totally possible. It's not um, it's not that difficult to to set that up. Yeah, and I I guess just a I mean, follow up, and I'm not necessarily looking for a response, but uh, you know as I'm thinking here, I, you know back to. What Matt had asked about what's in it for the investors, and is it you know if it's not a big return, is it control, and that you know of course could be problematic from our standpoint in the co-op world. Um, and that was you know the thing with preferred shares, uh, like the the equal exchange example. There you have a capped uh, return at six percent uh, per year, depending on how the business does. And we actually uh, in Montana, where I'm at, have a, a preferred shares uh, are built into the co-op regulation also capped at 6% um, per year. And so, and you had been, you know, mentioned, uh, you know, some of, as uh, you know, some of the, the structures uh, that you guys were, uh, you know, maybe uh, talking to people about having returns of zero to 3%. So even less than that per year, which again, makes me wonder why is a 6% return, you know, or at least a, a maximum 6% return share, not good enough. Um, if you're willing to take 3% with some control, then it looks like, okay, maybe there's more interest in the control than the return. Um, and just, again, coming from, you know, you know the, 
the skeptical co-op side. Like, um, so, you know, when you're talking about risk, I, you know, I think the, from the co-op side, the risk of losing autonomy, um, you know, because we're trying to have uh, more, um, you know, more money coming into the space to fund our stuff. And so I, I guess I'm kind of wondering, do you, do, are you, in your work, are you dealing mostly with the finance people? And so having to spend all your time convincing them that this is not just uh, some uh, hippie pie in the sky stuff, or uh, do you spend some time like uh, on the co-op side and have you um, had to deal with skepticism on that side as well, I guess? Mm. Yeah, I think most of the co-op skepticism we get is talking to fund managers who are investing in co-ops, um, who are looking for, um, you know, investors into their fund or source of the capital to grow their their portfolio, essentially. Um, and yeah, there, there's definitely a lot of frustration uh, around around that. Um, you know, if you can look at, uh, you know, comparable financial products that, yeah, you know, six percent return. It looks pretty good compared to some things, but looks bad compared to other things. Uh, and I think that's an important question that a lot of folks in the field are grappling with right now. It's like, you know, what do we compare this to? I think there's a train of thought that wants to figure out how to package uh, alternative ownership broadly, you know, in what I call a boring way. Like, can, can you not market this as some, you know, crazy outside thing, but actually say, look, this is like an asset class in and of itself. Uh, that is not something you should compare to your private equity or private debt investments, which will probably have a higher return, but something that is closer to a, you know, low, low risk, low return uh, part of a portfolio because investors portfolio is, is very diversified. There's all these different asset classes and um, different buckets. Um, so I think a big part of answering your question is what are we comparing uh, co-ops to? Um, in this interest rate environment too, I think this is another important point. You know, 6% is, you know, what you can get almost on like a, you know, high yield savings account these days, um, which, you know, it's tough. It, it makes the, certain things easier and certain things harder. Um, but, you know, you have to factor that in right now. Um, we've been in conversations with a group that is um, trying to develop a certificate of deposit deposit product um, that would help fund uh, a hypothetical uh, like fund of funds that could help uh, finance all of these alternative ownership funds. Um, and that's exactly what I mean of creating a product or packaging this stuff as boring. Nothing's more boring than, than a CD. You know, every, every bank on the corner, you know, will sell you a CD. But could you create one where part of the interest goes into a pool that helps, you know, maybe take out a layer uh, of the capital stack for a fund that, you know, needs to um, allocate money from uh, lots of different asset allocators? Um, I think that's, you know, a potentially interesting use of a traditional financial product. So um, now we're getting into the weeds a little bit, but I, I think... Uh, and the answer, as usual, is like it depends how you're how you're looking at it. But there is frustration uh, from the co-op, as as there should be. My my understanding is Equal Exchange had actually done a form of CD based financing or CD driven financing. I was uh, co organized a co-op finance day long conference um, about ten years ago, and they were one of our presenters. I think it was Rodney North actually from Equal Exchange at the time who, um, who, and they, and they worked out some deal with a local bank that knew them well. And so it was possible to buy a CD and have that money essentially be invested in equal exchange, but it had the safety of a, of a certificate of deposit. Do you know anything about that? had you heard about that? No, I actually haven't heard of that. Um, yeah, there, there might be no, some useful history there. Yeah. Yeah. I think the local credit union or a local bank was a key part of it that helped to make it happen, I think. But 
Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that. I've wondered about these statutes that provide for shares, like the Massachusetts Worker Co-op statute, which I think capped returns at 8%, if I recall correctly. And then I think there was maybe an LCA that got passed in Washington State a few years ago that I think had capped at 12%. But I was wondering about the wisdom of putting a cap, a fixed cap, in a statute, as opposed to something that's calibrated to inflation, say X percent above inflation could be a cap instead, because I remember the interest rates of the late 70s and early 80s, which were in the double digits. And it would be a shame if, if outside investment to co-ops would be subject simply to whatever's going on with inflation currently. We would not want to tie ourselves too much to a fixed rate of return, I would guess, a statute-based fixed rate of return. But I've wondered about that because I'm not sure how, you know, are, have there been conversations about, you know, how to have a cap on a rate of return that is, you know, floats with inflation? Have you seen anything like that? No, I haven't. And I mean, this is, uh, you know, venturing to the the policy terrain. Um, I would guess that the state employee ownership centers that are um, cropping up around the country would be um, able to answer that question. I, I wonder, because I'm sure there's states that don't have, um, don't have this legislation at all. So there might be opportunity to have that discussion, um, you know, before, before it's passed, but on, on, on paper, it makes sense that it would maybe be tied to a formula that's based on inflation rather than a hard cap. Um, to, to echo, um, you have something, Matt? I can wait. Oh, I just want to make sure that we give Kurt. I just I'm wondering, like, are we asking you the right questions, Kurt? Is there something that you would you're like, why are these people talking about all this other stuff and not this super exciting thing? I wanna talk about i want to give you a chance to answer the question you really wish that we were asking you mm. <laughs> before we end i just want to make sure that that's put that pin in there yeah well it's, it's kind of a cop-out but you know all of all of these questions are are super interesting um there's so much there's so much happening right now in in this world and there's so much to be done um and transfer finance is kind of like going in between all of these different conversations um, and right now figuring out where, where we're best, uh, best use useful and, and what we really want to focus on for 2024. So I'm in a very like wide eyed, uh, you know, learning mode and trying to get into all these conversations. Um, but let's see question or. Hmm. I guess one thing that I haven't talked too much about is um, the the work that we have just uh, you know reached a major milestone on in documenting different ownership models because we've been talking mostly about cooperatives today, uh, and I think it's it's an exciting time because there's there's a lot of new types of business forms that folks are using to. Um, uh, to distribute wealth and power to employees and to other stakeholders too, like this uh, organically grown company model that I mentioned, which has a multi-stakeholder approach. I think it's kind of interesting to to see some of the new stuff happening uh, with like multi-stakeholdership with uh, perpetual purpose trusts. So we just put out a report that documents uh, you know about a dozen different enterprise models uh, that are all kind of not shareholder centric, but doing so in different ways. Hmm. Um, so this is this is a big area for us is um, you know not just thinking about how do we get more capital into the cooperative space, but also uh, into um, mm -hmm. some of these some of these emerging models and funds that are doing employee ownership in, in new ways. Um, and uh, you know I'm kind of foreshadowing you know some of our work in 2024 but another big piece is some of these models are trying to do so at scale um you know you have private equity who's starting to do partial employee ownership conversions this is not cooperative this is you know a share ownership uh you know some very small percentage of the company but at a massive scale you know um you know companies that are far larger than uh, you know even the biggest co-ops 
Um, which I think is interesting to consider, you know, in this kind of broad universe of models that are not just the traditional investor centric uh, version. Uh, and there's, there's a lot of kind of uh, innovate or yeah, innovation is happening in between private equity and regular co-op. You know, there's funds like uh, new majority capital, good scout capital, which are doing acquisitions, uh, and sharing some value with workers, but not to the extent of co-ops or 100% owned ESOP. Um, so I think right now a big, a big area of inquiry is, you know, what is, what's the right balance, you know, of scale and wealth power, uh, distributed to workers, um, you know, we're kind of in a live experiment phase as a field. Uh, and I think I think there's right to have some hesitation around some of these models, but there's also uh, a right to have some excitement around it. Um, so I, I come from being 10 years in a worker co-op as a worker owner, which was also a conversion. That was my first conversion. And then since then, I've been a freelance co-op developer for 15 years, focusing mostly on worker co-op. And I've had to, and I'm saying that because I want to point out that I'm, my thoughts on this have shifted and are sort of transitional as I have worked more conversions and bigger conversions. I've been developing an appreciation that I didn't have before about the complexity of the deal structure for buying out a worker, for a worker buyout. And I used to think that it needed it. Well, I, I still believe that it needs to be simple enough so that the workers can readily understand it when they're making a decision as to whether or not to buy out the owner. Okay. And that's a lot of what I do is educate workers who are considering buying a company from an owner and trying to make sure they understand everything they need to understand about the deal in order to vote yes or no. And so that means that the complexity of a deal, whether it's a startup deal or a buyout deal, the complexity of any financing deal is a huge factor in the empowerment of the workers, actually. They need to be able to understand. And you know, I've worked with I've worked with startups where people are illiterate. I'm training them in finances and they can't read or write. Okay. And so so there's you know, there, there's there's a, a tension here between are we really, you know, cultivating an ownership culture? Are we really enfranchising workers in a worker buyout, for example? And how complex is the financing deal that might be necessary for the buyout to happen or that some or or that the owner might consider is necessary or that the investors consider to be necessary? And so that's huge. And so. But I, like I say, I'm kind of torn about this because I've seen large conversions, multi-million dollar conversions, worker buyouts, that where the deal closed only because there was a complex deal structure in place that provided the capital that was needed. And so I was like, damn, that deal wouldn't have happened if not for someone who knew how to construct a complex deal structure. And yet on the other hand, it's like, I'm the guy that has to try to explain this to the workers and have them actually make a sincere informed decision. Mm -hmm. So as we're talking about these emerging models, I'm like, okay, I'm out here trying to help these folks build a workplace democracy where they're making these very consequential decisions about becoming co-owners. So that's, I would love to hear your thoughts about that tension between, you know, deals mustn't get more complex than the workers can understand right? Versus, you know, we actually want these larger, more complex deals to actually happen. Love to hear your thoughts about that. And uh, Josh or Matt, if you have anything to add or follow up questions, please go ahead. Yeah, well, this is an interesting point, because when I think about the worker, uh, the worker education, uh, that needs to happen. I typically think about like the resulting governance structure, right? Like um, in a co-op, obviously, uh, well, you can set it up in different ways. Some are fully democratic where, you know, all workers are members and they vote uh, on everything, but you can also have, you know, some representative elements where all workers are only voting on some things. Sometimes they elect boards, 
you know, there's a lot of different ways to do it, but you know, there, no matter what it is, you need to have all the workers on board uh, and ready to participate in that structure. I think some of the models that are emerging that I'm talking about, and forgive me if I'm, if I was being a little vague, um, but you know, so like I mentioned the private equity versions that are doing partial uh, employee ownership. There's a couple other uh, new funds that are doing partial employee ownership. Um, some with the idea that it'll grow over time, but uh, I, either way, I, I think of less the deal structures of like, okay, how's this conversion finance? But I think of the resulting governance structure and also the kind of economic structure because the workers want to know, okay, if I own a piece of the pie, like when, when do I get my money and, and how do I, you know, how is that going to happen? Um, but sounds like you're saying, Jim, that you're, uh, you think there's a lot of work that also goes into kind of getting a sense of how the deal works. I'm curious how, how that's shown up, like in, mm -hmm. in the finance process. Well, we're, we'll typically do like a worker ownership readiness training, ideally as part of the conversion process, which is why it can take several months. And we try to make sure, you know, they understand what a worker co-op is, how a workplace democracy can work. As you point out, there's multiple governance models that can go on in a worker co-op. We try to make sure they're educated about each of the models so that they can choose one that feels right to them. And they're gonna to lean towards a representative democratic governance structure if they're larger. They tend to lean towards a flat collectivist structure if they're smaller. But those are th there's variability in that. There are some larger worker co-ops that use direct democracy, right? There are smaller ones that use representative democracy. So there's a tension there, but in, in the course of training them, we're, we're training them in we're training them in the potential governance models and and supporting them in choosing a governance model through this process. And then we also train them in worker co-op finances. And in the process of that, we're bringing them up to speed on the potential deal structures hmm. of the buyout. And all this is before the deal closes. We're tra so we're training them in it. We're helping them design their governance models and their financial models, and we're supporting them in learning about what deal structure is best. So we're doing all of it at the same time, in a way, in a very real sense, we're doing it all at the same time. So yeah, we're designing their governance while we're educating them about potential deal structures. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Yeah. And that makes sense. That makes sense because, you know, the a big part of the finances is how are you paying off the debt? that was used to finance the conversion, no matter, no matter how it was done, how the deal was structured, you know, there is a, there's a piece, there's a, you know, a schedule that, that, you know, workers now in charge of the finances need to be aware of. Um, I think some of the, uh, some of these new models have less of the workplace democracy elements that worker co-ops do. Um, so that is, um, you know, I, I it's, it's a trade-off, right? If you're not providing workers the autonomy in the workplace, say it's a traditional management structure, it could even be the same leadership under, you know, new ownership. Uh, maybe workers are less involved in the finances uh, and don't need to have that component. However, uh, I think it's very important to stress that I think the impact of all worker ownership, regardless of the model, whether it's worker co-op, ESOP, one of these new partial employee ownership forms, employee ownership trusts, all of the impacts are strengthened when you have uh, ownership culture developed among the workers, you know, at a very base level, um, understanding what the new structure is, why it's important, at a minimum, implementing pieces like open book management, uh, you know, L avenues for worker voice, even in a non-cooperative structure um, is going to strengthen the quality of the jobs for all the workers. Um, I think there's a lot of demonstrated benefits of, of this. Um, so that's not to let these partial models off the hook in terms of, you know, making sure the workers are, are uh, given some form of power. But I think a lot of them are, you know, at the minimal end compared to cooperatives, worker cooperatives at the at the deepest end of employee of employee voice and, and governance. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Jeff. Uh, if I can have one closing comment, thank you for expanding on that, Kurt, and for your candor about it. Um, I'll hazard a prediction, uh, which means I'll probably eat these words 
sometime in the future, but that we do have these emerging models coming out. There's potentially a lot of them. My sense is out of sheer practicality, there will be a shakeout of the models. We will get down to a relatively small number of models that are used most of the time. And the concern I have, since I come from the perspective of trying to develop empowered economic democracy culture, which in a worker co-op means workplace democracy, um, I'm, uh, I'm concerned that, you know, who will shape which models are used most often? Who will have the most influence over which minority of models rise to the top as those used most often? And, and will, the, will there be enough options that actually enfranchise workers uh, appropriately? Um, you know, because who has the power here, really? So that's, that's my concern is that there will be a shakeout and that we may, we may not have a model that becomes commonly used in which workplace democracy is a fundamental force. Mm -hmm in in the in the structuring of the final deal so there's, there's a question mark at the end of that but i wanted to put that on the table i hope that's helpful yeah yeah i i share i share the concerns i want to say that the cooperative model will always be on the table uh and i think the co-op movement is strong and resilient enough to to maintain that but it could be you know, if the scale of worker ownership grows a ton, maybe the rising tide doesn't lift all boats in some of these, you know, more scalable, more commercial models. Uh, mm -hmm. Which you know, I think are there to, to be very clear, they're better than mm -hmm. the traditional way of doing business mm -hmm. uh, in terms of you know the absolute uh, value that might go to workers and these partial ownership models. They, they, they build wealth for workers. Um, but it, it, you know, it's very different than, than a worker cooperative. Um, mm -hmm. And I think the risk is, does employee ownership become associated with those models as opposed to, uh, co cooperatives and, you know, from a policy and public, uh, perspective, that's mm -hmm. what people think of. And, you know, there's no longer, you know, attention being paid to the economic democracy versions of employee ownership. I think that's that's a risk, and we should all be prepared to to make sure it doesn't happen. Really appreciate it, Kurt. Thank you for your time, and I hope we get to do some follow up conversation at some point in the future when it works for all of us. This is great. Yeah, that was fun. Thanks all. Thanks so much.